Hey folks, welcome back for some more physics here. Um, the roller coaster loop is a uh, pretty classic physics problem. Um, this is given in a number of different varieties, and it's a good one that combines a few different areas of what we would study in a first year physics class. Um, so we've got a little bit of circular motion in, and a little bit of conservation of energy in there as well. Um, people go wrong on this problem by thinking along the lines of if we want the roller coaster to go around the loop, all we have to do is get it up to a position like this um, and, and just focus on the height that it has to get to. So then they'll be thinking, okay, well, if it needs to get up to that height, that level of potential energy, then it must have to start at that same height, so something like this, and we'll have plenty of energy to get around. Um, the problem there is that if we do get to this height um, with zero kinetic energy, all potential energy, and that's all we think about, well, that thing is now stopped at the top of this circle. And so if you imagine a roller coaster car start stopping at the top of the circle, it doesn't stay stopped very long. In fact, very shortly after that, it's going to be moving again uh, straight down here. So that is a bad situation to be in here. Um, now, realistically, it wouldn't make it all the way to the top. In that scenario, it would start to fall off the track even before it got to a speed of zero. But um, if we imagine that scenario, it, it just doesn't, doesn't quite work out. So we need to focus on not just the uh, uh, potential energy, sorry, yeah, not just potential energy, but also kinetic energy. It's going to have to have some amount of kinetic energy at that point. So at that point, in order to figure out that kinetic energy, we need to know speed. And we're dealing with speed going around a circle, and we're going to be thinking about forces around that circle. And so um, we'll be thinking free body diagram on this. Free body diagram for that moment where it's upside down like that, we're going to have forces acting downward. We'll have gravity acting downward as it always does. And then we can also uh, imagine that it's in contact with the track, and the track is keeping the car from you know, falling through the track. There's an electromagnetic repulsion there. We usually call those normal forces. So there'll be some normal force as well. And if we slowed it down more and more, um, expect that at some point it would get too slow and it would not make it all the way around the track. And so it would actually fall off the track. If it wasn't touching the track, the normal force would disappear. Normal force is a contact force. And so what we need is for normal force not to disappear. We don't want to lose that contact force, because if we lose the contact force, it means we've lost contact. We don't want to lose contact. We want to keep the car in contact with the, uh, um, with the track. But we are looking for the minimum height, which is going to correspond with the minimum speed going around there. So the faster we go, the more force it's going to take to move that, uh, make that car go around on that circular track, more um, centripetal force to make it turn fast enough. So we're going to imagine that normal force here is going to get smaller and smaller and smaller and approach zero. We don't actually want it to go to zero, but we want it to approach zero. So if we imagine that that normal force is 0.00001 newtons, Hey, that's something. It's still in contact with the track. That's good enough. Um, of course, if you were designing a roller coaster, you'd probably want to give yourself a bit more of a margin of error so that, say, on a windy day, you wouldn't have uh, catastrophic problems, but we're ignoring air resistance on this problem, I suppose. All right, so we're going to have normal force approach zero, which in our calculations means we're actually going to just treat it like it is zero which is sort of a funny thing to do after we just talked about how we don't want it to actually go to zero. We just want it to be such a small value that we can round it off to zero and still get very good results. So normal force approaching zero on this. Let's try setting this problem up numerically first, and then the second time through we'll set it up just with, uh, with variables. Um, we're given a value for mass and for radius of the circular loop here. Um, it turns out in these problems that mass actually cancels every step of the way, so we don't actually need to know the mass, which is a really nice thing since uh, I've never seen anybody weighing each person as they get onto the roller coaster and uh, you know making adjustments to track as a result. So hopefully it, 
the path of that roller coaster, the ability to go around the loops, is not dependent on mass, which does bear out in the, the process we do here. So let's first think along the lines of that uh, centripetal motion, the uh, Newton's second law for centripetal motion, which is centripetal acceleration is equal to net force in the centripetal direction divided by mass. And we know we can calculate centripetal acceleration, the magnitude of that, by doing v squared over r, speed squared over the radius of the circle. And then the only force that's going to be um, anything other than very, 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 very close to zero is uh, in the centripetal direction is a gravitational force, fg, and then divide by the mass. And so our v squared, that's what we're trying to figure out at this stage, so we'll leave that as a variable, divided by the radius, which is 10 meters on this loop. And then fg, force of gravity, that's going to be our mass times if that's 1,000 kilograms times the acceleration due to gravity, 9.8 meters per second squared. And then on the bottom, we've got our mass, 1,000 kilograms. And like I said, cancels right out. All right. So then solving for v, um, we can say v squared is equal to, and we'll multiply it both sides by the 10 meters and get 98. And that'll be meters squared per second squared. Then we'll square root both sides. And we get v equals, and this one comes out to 9.9 .9 meters per second. So we know now the speed at that point. We also can figure out the height at that point, which lets us get both energy types there. We just need to be a little careful um, about the height. So the height here is going to be double the radius. So this is 20 meters, not 10 meters. So be a little careful there. Um, we'll say that initial is going to be up on top of the, um, the ramp there, and final is going to be when it's at the top of the loop. So we say that our total energy initial is equal to our total energy final. And this is assuming that we have no work done. Um, we could have work done by friction or by air resistance, but we're going to neglect both of those for the cases of this problem. So our total energy at the beginning is just going to be gravitational potential energy. Our total energy at the end is going to be a combination of gravitational potential energy and kinetic energy. So we've got m, g, and then uh, y, not, for our initial potential energy. Our final gravitational potential energy will be m, g, y, and final kinetic energy will be one-half m, v squared. Now, um, I'll go ahead and plug in the masses, even though we can see here that uh, every term has a thousand kilograms or has a, uh, an m in it. So we could divide all terms by m, get that to cancel out. But since we got the number, I'll include that on this stage. And we'll eliminate that in the next, uh, the next go around of this problem. So we've got a thousand kilograms and 9.8 meters per second squared. And our initial height, which uh, is what we're looking for, so I will actually leave that as the variable, and we called that h earlier. And then over here, a thousand kilograms, 9.8 meters per second squared, and 20 meters, two times that radius, plus one half, times a thousand kilograms, times 9.9 .9 meters per second, and that gets squared. Okay, so on this side, we've got 9,800, and that is kilogram meters per second squared, and it's the same as newtons, times h. On the right side, we've got, let's see, 1,000 times 9.8 would be 9,800 as well, times 2 would be 19,600, times another 10 would be 196,000. And those are kilogram meters squared per second squared. Plus, and then we've got 1 half times 1,000. The 9.9 .9 squared is easy to do since we just square rooted to get that, so that would be 98. 
Um, so 98 times a half, that'd be 49 times a thousand, so that is 49,000, and that is kilogram meters squared per second squared. All right, and then we'll combine those terms on the right side, leave this side as is. 196,000 and 49,000, so that would be uh, 245,000 kilogram meters squared per second squared. All right, and then my height, H, is going to be just the, the 245,000 over 9,800, and that one, we'll do it this way, 200 and, oops, And so that's going to give us a height of 25 meters on this one. So again, the idea that uh, we, we have to go a little bit higher than, uh, um, than that uh, 20 meters that we're going to be at um, as our starting point, that's, that extra height gets translated into kinetic energy, which gives us the speed necessary to make it around the track without falling off. Now, Sometimes we'll see that same problem set up but without any numbers given, so let's set that up real quick. Um, so again, we start with our uh, uh, centripetal acceleration equals net force over mass, AC equals net centripetal force divided by mass. We make that V squared over R equals going to be force gravity over M again. That part hasn't changed. And then V squared over R equals mg, so m's cancel. And then V squared is equal to, well, it's just g times R now. And so V equals square root gr. And then going back to our energy considerations, our total energy initial has to equal our total energy final. And we've got just gravitational potential energy initial, and then both gravitational potential and um, kinetic energy. And so gravitational potential energy on the initial side will be mg, and the y naught I'm just going to put in as h, that's the value we're trying to solve for. Over here, we're going to have mg, and then the height on this, this distance right here, is going to be the same as the diameter of the circle, or 2r, plus 1 half mv squared. All right, and we know the, uh, the value for v from earlier. Um, we also have an m in all terms, so I'm going to cancel out the m's first. Divide all sides by uh, all terms by m. And then we've got GH equals 2GR plus 1 half, and then V squared is the term there, so I'm just going to plug in this variation then, rather than plugging in square root of GR and then squaring it again, 1 half GR. So I have 2GR plus 1 half GR, and now I see that um, all terms have a G in them as well. So let's cancel those. We'll divide all sides, or all terms by G. And we had H is equal to well, 2R plus 1 half R, or H equals 5 halves R. So the general solution on that one, and if we plug in the value for R that we had earlier, which was 10 meters. 10 meters times 5 halves does give us, in fact, 25 meters, which is what we solve for as our answer here. So a little bit of trickiness with uh, remembering to account for both potential and kinetic energy in that state where it's up at the top of the loop. Also tricky in that we have to combine our circular motion stuff with our gravitational, um, or sorry, with our uh, uh, conservation of energy stuff. Um, but these are great problems to know how to do um, and show up frequently on AP exams and in physics classes in general. Um, so hopefully you found this, uh, this video useful. If you have, by all means, like, share, and subscribe. Thank you very much, everybody.